Hey everyone, John Lorden here. It's February 21st, 2018, and we have a fresh case for you on today's Brain Scratch Searchlight. Well, fresh in terms of I haven't covered it before, but this case is actually from a few years ago of a young woman that went missing. There's some very mysterious circumstances around it, of course. Uh, it was covered on Disappeared. We're gonna touch on that a little bit by the end of this video as well. And of course, I'll let you know where you can catch that episode if you wanna check it out for yourself. Uh, today, we are looking into the case of Tiffany Heaven Daniels. And I wanna give a very quick thank you to Brain Scratcher Cal for uh, getting me started on this case and sending me some additional information. I really appreciate it. So as we can see here from the photo, um, she was 25 when she went missing. She has blonde hair, blue eyes. She's five foot seven and she has tattoos on both feet. And you can see they actually have a picture of the tattoos. It's a seed uh, that is growing into a plant and all the tattoos are basically connected to show the growth that is happening from the seed as the plant grows out of it. Tiffany was last seen on August 12th, 2013. Her car, bicycle, and cell phone were found in a parking lot near Fort Pickens on August 20th, 2013. Uh, she's still missing. We need your help to find her. Of course, they have contact information, which I will copy into the description box below. If you have any information about this case that you think could be helpful, please put it in the hands of people that can act on it. Use that contact information in the description box below. Uh, let's start with NamUs, uh, the official record here for this missing persons case. Tiffany Heaven Daniels. Uh, she has a nickname of uh, I, I think it's Evan, E-A-V-E-N. Uh, e it's heaven without the H. Um, she was last seen, as we mentioned, August 12th, 2013. Uh, I believe it was around 5 p.m., if I recall correctly. Uh, she would now be 29 years old, white female, and of course, they're giving us all the same information. But here we get a weight on her somewhere between 130 to 150 pounds. Um, she is missing from Pensacola, Florida, that is in the county of Escambia. And here we get some circumstances. Tiffany Daniels was last seen on the evening of August 12th, leaving Pensacola State College where she worked as a theater technician. Her car was found parked outside Fort Pickens on Santa Rosa Island on August 20th, containing her purse, phone, and bike. She has still not been found. Uh, let's jump ahead a little bit and learn a little about this Fort Pickens area because the first time I heard it, I was thinking military base of some kind. Fort Pickens is a pentagonal historic United States military fort on Santa Rosa Island in the Pensacola, Florida area. It is named after American Revolutionary War hero, Andrew Pickens, and it is currently administered by the National Park Service. So this is not an active uh, military installation. This is now a park where you can basically go and spend time, and apparently there are beaches uh, there as well. Um, I think it's pretty important to understand that Tiffany is a woman that is, I guess you'd probably say she's a little bit earthy or maybe you might even call her a hippie. Uh, she's a vegetarian. She's a bit of a free spirit. She really likes to uh, kind of do things off the top of her head. She's spontaneous. Um, a lot of people that care about her have all pretty much lined up in terms of how they would describe her. Uh, and it's one of those things that's tough with a case like this because when you have someone with that type of personality, there's a couple things that pop into my mind right off the bat. One of them is, of course, is did she just leave? Is this some type of spontaneous change of life that she's looking for? But then there's the other question of risky behavior. You know, um, is she into meeting new people, people that maybe she doesn't really thoroughly check on before she gets close to? Um, we're going to learn some more about that as we go forward in this case as well. For physical description, uh, here they have her hair color noted as sandy. Uh, in the pictures I've seen, yeah, I guess I would call it sandy blonde uh, myself. Tiffany has neck length hair and it is wavy. Uh, she does not typically shave her underarms. Uh, I also noticed in some of the photos that I saw uh, of her hiking, I'm not sure if she uh, shaves her legs all the time either. She has kind of fine um, blonde hair. So uh, just know that that might be another aspect on this. Uh, left eye color and right eye color, both blue. Uh, once again, they're noting the tattoos, the life cycle of a plant from seed to full grown plant. Um, no piercings 
and really nothing else for distinctive body features outside of that. Uh, clothing and accessories, we don't have a good description, which is a little surprising to me, but it seems like there's a gap of time in this story. We know that she was um, at the state college working on a set. She asked if she could leave early. They said, sure. So someone knows what she was wearing at that point. But between then and uh, where she winds, well, where, where her vehicle winds up at the beach, um, there's a bit of a gap of time. So she definitely could have changed. We know that her work boots from uh, the set construction she was doing, they were actually found in her vehicle. Um, so it's it's strange that we have absolutely no clothing description here. I would think that they would at least put in the most recent sighting uh, clothing description. For the transportation method, a Toyota 4Runner that was a 1999 gray, it's an SUV, they have the tag number here, but her, ve her vehicle's already been found. Um, it's not clear when she and the forerunner parted ways, but we're going to get some more details about uh, the status of how the vehicle was found and a uh, time frame around when it probably arrived at the beach. No dental information, DNA information is submitted, fingerprint information also submitted. Kind of rare for cases um, on people this young to actually have some fingerprint info, so uh, I'm happy that that's there. And here is, once again, the tattoos that are on the top of her feet. So I know I mentioned kind of potentially risky behavior. Um, if you look into web sleuths on this case, you're going to see a lot of people talking about this aspect. So I just wanted to try to address it quickly and fairly here. Uh, there is a profile for Tiffany at a website called couchsurfing.com. And I haven't used this site before. I didn't know anything about it before today. But from what I gather, it is a site where if you are a traveler, uh, perhaps international traveler, you can sign up on this site. You can meet other people that are willing to let you kind of crash on their couch or they will give you some place to stay for a night. Uh, and maybe they'll, you know, take you and show you around town or something like that. So um, one thing that's good about this profile is we get a little bit of information written from her about what type of person she is. So I just want to go over a couple things here. Um, her current mission is to meet some great people. Under the philosophy section, she said, today at the beach, I came to the conclusion that it is good to bring something like a Frisbee. Even if you don't speak the same language with someone, Frisbee has its own. Um, and I think she probably started this profile when she was traveling uh, in another country. Uh, there seems to be some information I'm seeing around that, but uh, let's see what else we have here. Couch surfing experience. I have been hosted on couch surfing once while in Florence and facilitated the, the hosting of several couch surfers in Pensacola, including picking them up at the Greyhound station and showing them around the area. So once again, it's just, it's a little bit of a question, um, but this is the type of person she is. You know, she's, like I said, a free spirit. She's someone that wants to meet other people. She seems to have a lot of trust in humanity could that be playing into this case in some way? Possibly. Could this couch surfing thing play into this case directly? Uh, from what I understand, not quite. And it's hard because I can't really find definitive information on it, but there is a commenter on web sleuths. They seem to be close to the case. They seem to be close to the friends, the circle of friends around Tiffany. Um, and they said on web sleuths that the information um, that they heard uh, I believe actually from the Facebook page, uh, which I went and tried to verify, but I couldn't find it at the Facebook page, is that police did look into the, this website and it seemed like Tiffany had not logged into this website since the previous June and then she goes missing in August. So I don't know if this website really has any connectivity to her actually uh, going missing. That sounds like a bit of a gap, especially for this type of service where uh, it seems like you're pretty much meeting people really quick and for short periods of time. Interests. I really, really love to dance. Swing dancing is where I got started back in high school. The past couple of years, I've become more interested in biking. I'm about to go on a bike trip through the Keys with my fellow. Um, she has a boyfriend. He unfortunately had to move away to go to a different school, but they were going to try a long distance relationship. And that's something that happened fairly recently before she disappeared. And um, a lot of her friends seem to suggest that 
she wasn't quite the same person after he left, that maybe she was struggling uh, being with, with being a bit depressive. Uh, she had roommates that were living with her, and apparently she wasn't really good about making them pay the bills. She would kind of just pay the bills herself. She was starting to get in some financial trouble um, to the point where she actually went looking for a new roommate, for a responsible roommate. She put an ad on Craigslist. Uh, that's another area where a lot of people are curious. Wait, wait, wait. You know, she just had this ad on Craigslist, I think in July, which now we're getting pretty close to the time frame. Uh, could it have been someone that she met on Craigslist that did something to her or something along those lines? But I enjoy making pottery, figure drawing, fixing things that are ripped or broken, and spending time with things that are naturally green, of course. Um, so I don't know. Seems like a nice person to me. Uh, like I said, maybe she's doing stuff that I personally wouldn't do, but we're all different people here. Jumping over to The Charlie Project, once again, I just have to say it, I always appreciate how good The Charlie Project is at putting all these photos together, because uh, particularly for Tiffany, she can look uh, considerably different from one photo to the next. So please take a few moments. Um, of course, I'll have these links in the description box below and really look through several of these pictures. Don't just take one or two and kind of say, oh, that's what she looks like. Um, Cause as you can see from picture to picture here, her look can vary pretty significantly. Um, down in the details, let's get a little more information here. The car had two fingerprints on the door. So once her forerunner was found, they did a bit of a forensic uh, search on it because they already knew she was missing for a number of days by the time the car is found. They did find two fingerprints that don't match her or any of her family or friends. From what I remember uh, from the disappeared episode, they found a fingerprint, I believe on the steering wheel and I believe on the driver's side door. Um, they ran the prints through their, uh, online, through their database, but they were unable to identify the person that the prints came from. Uh, before she went missing, she had told her work supervisor she would be gone for several days, but didn't say why, and she didn't tell anyone else either. And this is very strange. Her family doesn't quite understand what this is about. Um, even if she was going to kind of be spontaneous, she would typically let someone know where she was going, what she was doing. Now, I know I mentioned previously she was talking about getting a more responsible roommate. A little bit of a weird situation came out of that. She wound up having uh, the father of a friend of hers move in. So this guy that is in his early 50s, he's going through a divorce. He's looking for a place to live. He sees the ad on Craigslist and replies to it. And it turns out to be the father of a friend of hers. Uh, she's okay with that. She lets him move in and they live together for a period of time. If I recall correctly, he moves in in July and then about a month later, she goes missing. Now he has some interesting information about um, the night that she, well, the morning before she went missing. Uh, he thought he heard a lot of footsteps going kind of in and out of the house really early in the morning. I've seen different time frames. Some say 3 a.m., some say 5 a.m., but something very early. Uh, her family says that's really strange, that she is not a morning person. She probably wouldn't be up. They even, in the disappeared episode, they, they made it sound like uh, she would run a little bit late all the time. Like if she was supposed to be somewhere at seven, she might leave at seven to get to that spot. So uh, not someone that is very timely. But anyway, her roommate noticed these weird noises. Uh, and then we also have a little bit of strangeness in that after she leaves school, she leaves the theater department at school. Um, she apparently went back home and he was home at the same time, but he somehow missed her. Now he says he was on the phone with his uh, new girlfriend and they were on the phone the entire time and maybe he just didn't hear her come in. But police are fairly confident that she actually did wind up going home before traveling to the beach or before whatever happened happened to get her vehicle to the beach. So something to, to keep in mind there. But in terms of this trip, we really have no idea. I'm assuming it's a trip. Maybe she just needed some time off because she was stressed. Uh, another weird event around all this was, uh, I believe it's the day she's missing or maybe just the day after, the power at their place uh, knocked out. And uh, the roommate pretty much assumes that it was because she didn't pay the bill. So maybe she was having even more financial troubles than we were aware of. 
Uh, let's take a look at Huffington Post from August 21st, 2013. Tiffany Daniels missing, car found abandoned at Florida Beach. Uh, Tiffany Heaven Daniels, 25, was last seen on August 12th getting into her vehicle at Pensacola State College where she works in the school's theater department. Friends and family were unable to make contact with Daniels after she left work and she was reported missing. Quote, we didn't have any developments until a friend of mine was out for a bike ride yesterday and found the car parked at the very last public parking lot at Pensacola Beach, Daniel's sister, Angela Huntsinger, told the Huffington Post. According to Huntsinger, the car appeared undamaged and investigators found that it contained her sister's bicycle, cell phone, and other personal belongings. Police scoured the area, but have no leads so far. So the investigator shared a little more information in the disappeared episode about this. Um, the bicycle apparently had sand on the tires, but they didn't notice sand like on the floorboards, particularly of, of probably the driver's section. So it seemed to them that she might have gone there to do a bike ride. And her family says that that is something that she probably would have likely have done. Um, she would just want to be out in nature and she'd throw her bike in her forerunner, go somewhere, take her bike out and go for a ride. So one of the theories that's been kicked around this is, did she potentially go out for a bike ride, um, put her bike back in her vehicle and then jump into the water to go for a swim? Uh, and then if she did go for a swim, did something happen to her? Uh, did she have some type of accident, you know, swim out too far, get pulled by some type of current, which apparently they do have some, uh, some really nasty currents that can happen out there. Uh, so that is certainly one of the theories that is being considered in this case as well. But police are fairly confident that something of hers or her should have washed back up on the beach at some point if she did drown out there. And that has never happened. You know, we're now um, four and a half years later, still no sign of her. So I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the percentage, you know, how likely it is uh, for bodies to come back to the shore is, uh, especially if you have some strange tide situation or, or currents going on out there. Uh, moving forward to pnj.com and jumping forward um, in time a bit, friends and family gather for missing Tiffany Daniels on Tuesday, one year after she went missing. The dozen lanterns drifted into the Tuesday night breeze across Pensacola Bay, one lantern for each month that Tiffany Heaven Daniels has been missing. And that's something that's fairly clear to me after looking through this. Her family has been working really, really hard. Uh, here's a picture of them um, doing everything they can to keep awareness raised to this. Um, there are a lot of searches that have been organized. They covered a lot of the beach trying to find her. Um, they are really being open to all these different theories, including some theories that aren't you know, the happiest thing to think about. They're really being open to anything in terms of it being something that could potentially help them find Tiffany. Jumping forward again at PNJ, uh, Pensacola News Journal dot com, December 16th, 2015. Police and search personnel have a new lead. The family of Tiffany Daniels announced they needed help identifying a man who was spotted in or around Daniels' vehicle twice in the days after she went missing. The individual is described as a white male who is between 30 and 40 years of age and was wearing only shorts at the time's of his sightings. In the initial door-to-door -door search after Daniels went missing, two vacationers reported seeing a man exiting her vehicle at the parking lot the same day it was found. After seeing media coverage of the two-year anniversary of Daniels' disappearance, a Pensacola citizen came forward and recounted seeing a white male wearing only red shorts near Daniels' vehicle on August 19th, 2013. And this is probably the most substantial lead um, that I've seen in this case uh, recently. And, you know, this this isn't all that recent. We're, we're talking a couple years ago already. Um, but I haven't seen any developments outside of this that really are pointing us in the direction that something strange is going on here. Uh, we could be talking about some type of foul play scenario. Uh, could it have happened at the beach? Could she have met someone at the beach? We've looked at her profile. We know that she was into meeting people. 
uh, and, and in particular, she was talking about having a Frisbee so she could, you know, even meet people that didn't speak the same language as her. So I don't think it would be very strange to imagine a situation where she went to the beach, maybe had her bike ride, bumped into someone, hung out with them a little bit, and maybe things potentially turned bad there. Um, I don't know, but it's pretty interesting to me that we have, you know, the two vacationers talking about seeing this man around the vehicle, and then we have a, a citizen that comes forward uh, two years later and kind of confirms that information. So it would seem to me that we need to find this guy. And that's a big part of the reason why I wanted to shoot this episode today and get this information out to you. May 25th, 2017, families and loved ones of missing persons gathered Thursday at Bartram Park, Bartram, sorry, Park in Pensacola, hoping to spread awareness and honor the people in their lives who seemingly disappeared. Quote, it's everyone's responsibility to make sure this is taken care of as a community, said Cindy Daniels, whose, daughter's Tiff, whose daughter Tiffany has been missing since 2013. It affects the entire community. It doesn't just affect one or two families. Um, those words just really ring true for me. And that's part of the reason why I do this every single week and why I ask all of you to please review these videos and please share them in those areas and keep exposure going to these cases. It takes more than just the people that are affected by these cases to be able to help these cases. So uh, I totally get what Cindy's saying there. The group was encouraged by those who joined them and discouraged by some people who did not uh, quote, you can get out there and enforce the law all you want to, said Daniels, of the lack of law enforcement or public officials at the walk. But how about we want to know your values are as good as our values or you care about family as much as we do? So becoming involved in community events like this and community outreach is very important for these people. Let me also say that um, both of the Daniels' parents have really, even if you look at Tiffany's Facebook page, you can see they are helping with numerous cases. Um, they got a lot of help from an organization. We're going to talk a little bit more at the end of this video. Um, they've been participating in helping that organization as well. Um, it's, it's really special to me. I always talk about it on this show, the strength that you see from people that are dealing with this, but when they're able to take that strength and benefit other people's cases and share their experience with other families that are going through this, I just, I can't imagine anything better in a horrible situation than being able to try to help other people in that way and maybe helping those people gives you just a little piece of relief or even a little shred of further hope that someone's going to come and help you or your case will eventually come to some type of um, meaningful conclusion. Maybe not always a happy conclusion, but certainly a meaningful one. And jumping forward in time again, Saturday marks four years since 25-year-old Tiffany Daniels vanished, but the investigation is still fresh with new tips continuing to come in. In the years that have followed, investigators at the Pensacola Police Department have chased lead after lead from people reporting local sightings to people attempting to extort the Daniels family. Um, I really recommend that you guys check out the Disappeared episode on this, if nothing else than to see the lengths that some people will go to to try to take money from these families that are in pain. It is really, really terrible. And they have a very good example here uh, in, in the Disappeared episode of this case. And not it's not just a good example in terms of seeing what people will do, but the steps that they take to figure out that that's being done are brilliant. And all it took was someone searching Google for about 15 minutes to put it together. So I really recommend you guys check that out. Uh, investigators also said keeping Tiffany's face fresh in people's minds can help jog memories. And of course, that's what I hope we're doing here today. Uh, so here is the page for Disappeared. Uh, specifically what you're looking for to see this episode, I had a little trouble trying to find it. It is in season seven and it is episode... Two, it's called Against the Tide. Uh, if you are paying for cable television here in the U.S. through a major uh, cable company, 
you can probably come here, sign right in and watch it uh, for no additional cost uh, right now. Uh, if you're not paying for TV through one of these major companies, um, I did, I couldn't find a legit place to watch it, unfortunately. But if you go looking around YouTube, you might find it, uh, especially if you go searching for Disappeared Against the Tide. I think that's, that's as far as I want to take that. Uh, several things were brought up by the episode I do want to cover with you. And of course, uh, at crimefeed.com, they have a little bit of a synopsis here. Uh, but they kind of lead us to different theories. So I just wanted to share these, these things with you as well. What was Tiffany planning to do the week after she went missing? Uh, baffling question. I mean, she's taking time off from work. She's not telling anyone about it. There's also some information that I saw at Web Sleuths about her potentially picking up a, bo a box of her clothes from where her boyfriend was living before he moved. So uh, is that does that mean that she was planning on taking off somewhere or was she just picking up a last box of stuff that she had left over at her boyfriend's house and he wasn't living there anymore so she had to go get it? I don't know. And also I couldn't find a good source on that info. So just take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. But I did see a lot of dialogue on Web Sleuths around that. Tiffany's roommate at the time of the disappearance noted that he had heard strange series of noises at the front door around 3 a.m. He was unable to explain what exactly he heard, but he and Tiffany's family insist that she is not typically a morning person. The early morning noises and the time at which Tiffany left the house for work struck everyone close to her as odd. And while her roommate insisted that he didn't see Tiffany again that day, police discovered that she did return to her house mid-afternoon while her roommate was home and on the phone in his bedroom. We still don't know why Tiffany alerted her supervisor that she would be gone for several days. Uh, Tiffany, told, uh, Tiffany had told her family and friends about her current artistic projects, plans to visit her boyfriend in Austin, and an upcoming dance party at her house. And they said it really well in the disappeared episode. She had plans for the following days, the following weeks, the following months. Uh, not typical, I think, for people that are running away from their life situation to, to kind of have those things strung out like that. And keep in mind, this is someone that really enjoyed her work. I actually took a look. I'm not going to put all her social media links in the description box below, um, but I did find uh, an account where they had a bunch of pictures of her uh, creating sets and stuff like that. She really enjoyed the work that she was doing. So I'm a former theater person myself. It is an artistic outlet and uh, it's not the easiest kind of thing to actually find work that you can actually make a little money at as well. So I'm really not sure what would have dragged her away from that. Uh, Tiffany's bike with sand on the wheels. I've already kind of talked to you guys about that. Did she perhaps take a ride on the bike, uh, then put it back in the car and then go for a swim? Um, I, I struggle a little bit. I've heard a couple references that possibly her keys were found in the car, but I can't find anything firm on that. So what I'm wondering is if she did go for, for a swim, um, where would she have put her keys? Uh, was there an alarm system for this Forerunner, 1999 Forerunner? I'd probably think that even if there's not an alarm system, there's at least a key fob to unlock the doors, keyless entry system of some kind. So I don't think you're going to swim with that necessarily on your person. Uh, but we have such a time gap from when Tiffany uh, went, went missing and when her vehicle was found. Is it possible that she you know, left some shoes and a towel on the sand somewhere and had her keys in the shoes and someone came along later and thought that that was all trash or put it in some um, lost and found somewhere. Uh, I don't know. But here we get some much tighter information about when the vehicle at least showed up there. The toll road leading to the beach helped to provide a timeline. Tiffany's vehicle passed the toll at 751 on Monday, August 12th, which is just three hours after she left work. Um, unfortunately, I don't have all the locations to really put a map together on this. I don't know how long the drive time is between these locations, but if you consider she left work at five, please confirm she stopped at home. And now by 7.51, she's getting to the beach. Uh, I don't know that there's a whole lot of time in there and it really depends on the travel time here, but is there a whole lot of time for something to have happened to her? Or was it really her driving to the beach and this thing didn't happen until after that? 
Still a big question. Sadly, there are no security cameras at the parking lot and the toll did not take video. Uh, it basically just gets little snapshots of the plates as you're coming through uh, the toll. Uh, it's unclear if Tiffany was driving or in the vehicle at all when the car parked, which is another interesting theory. Cal actually brought this up uh, as well. What if the car was put there just to completely throw off the investigation? Certainly possible, uh, especially when you consider that the we have these witnesses that are kind of talking about a guy being around the car. We don't know that Tiffany was in that location at all. Uh, and once again, car, uh, Tiffany's car had two fingerprints on the door that do not match her, her friends, or her family. And of course, police cannot find a match. Um, there is another potential sighting that has happened here. And unfortunately, in these cases, we do have these sightings come up. And you really have to take these with a grain of salt because people are generally good natured and they want to help other people when they hear about cases like this. So here's a sighting. I really don't know how much to invest in this, but uh, was she spotted in Louisiana along Interstate 10? Police began getting tips that Tiffany was seen at various locations across Interstate 10. Tiffany's mother got a particularly eerie tip describing an older Hispanic man with two younger women. Now it's strange because I think in the episode they actually said it was an older Hispanic woman with two younger women. I don't I don't know if there was necessarily a man there. Uh, one of the younger women appeared to resemble Tiffany. And when the waitress confronted her about the similarities, the trio of women abruptly left the restaurant. Unfortunately, the tip came in after security camera footage in the restaurant had been taped over. Of course, that always happens in these cases. Uh, another interesting tidbit here is the waitress relayed a story uh, about conversation that she had with the supposed Tiffany where... Um, this woman was trying to order something and she asked if the soup was uh, using chicken stock or not or not. And it really struck Tiffany's mother because she, her mother recalls a time where she was out with Tiffany somewhere and she had ordered soup and it was made with chicken stock and Tiffany was able to tell right away. And of course she didn't want to eat that because she's vegetarian. Now the thing her, her mother kind of puts a lot of connectivity there because she remembers that instance with Tiffany. And we've heard that from this waitress. The thing I struggle with is I'm also a vegetarian and I ask that question all the time. And my wife's a vegan and she asks that question all the time. So there is a considerable number of people out there that would likely be asking that question. I wouldn't lean on that as an identifying factor here. Um, and you also have this strange thing about how the waitress is handling this situation. You're seeing someone that you think is a missing person and you tell them, hey, aren't you that missing person? Um, you know, I don't know that that's the best way to handle that kind of situation. Um, I mean, it's, I guess it'd be really rough to try to get a picture of them somehow. Um, but if there is a recording system in the restaurant, why wouldn't the waitress at least have went and talked to their manager and said, hey, you know what, we need to keep this tape or we need to do some type of export of the video footage from tonight because I think that we had a missing person in here, particularly if the people left after you asked them about that. It's just this story doesn't feel quite right to me. I, I sincerely hope it is because it would, it would mean that Tiffany is still alive. Uh, and it's weird because I did find some other information about her travels where I believe that she actually took a trip uh, along Interstate 10 and went all the way to California at one time in the past. So, but it's strange because of this next twist here. So we have this potential sighting. Class Kids, which is the organization that I mentioned earlier that the family has... Um, has been helped by the family and now the family is also helping explain to the Daniels that their daughter could have fallen victim to a human trafficking ring. Florida ranks second or third in the list of States with the highest human trafficking rates. Um, it's tough because in these cases, if it's a young woman, the human trafficking theory almost always comes up. Uh, and obviously we've got a problem in this country with, with human trafficking. We know that it does indeed happen. Uh, do all these cases fit into that? I don't necessarily know. Um, 
it's it's a tough thing. We're going to be talking about it more uh, on Monday's Johnny Vlogs. We're having Destiny Rescue back. Uh, they deal with human trafficking internationally. It's a little bit different, but I'm sure that we're going to get some insight into the mechanisms. And here they, they even kind of nail some of them. Uh, it's not uncommon for women to be tricked, drugged, and manipulated into a trafficking ring. So if you wanna learn more about some of the control mechanisms that are used uh, in trafficking, particularly international, but like I said, I think some of it applies here as well. Please check out Johnny Vlogs, second time that we've had Destiny Rescue on the channel uh, on Monday, and we're gonna talk a lot more about that. Uh, I understand why it comes up in these cases because it's at least some form of hope for these people that their missing loved one is still alive out there, can still be rescued, can still come home, can be put through treatment and helped and given whatever they need to try to recover from that type of situation. So I think I understand why it comes up so much. And here you've got a sighting that, yeah, could, could lead to that conclusion as well. I just struggle with the details of the sighting. I struggle with the actions that the waitress took in this. And I just don't know if I can believe this sighting at face value, but that's just my personal opinion uh, that I'm left with. And I haven't talked to this waitress. I haven't even really seen any good information, uh, you know, like uh, an interview, you know, her own words about what the interaction was. But in the disappeared episode, you get to hear the family side of it, at least from what they were told about all this. So uh, of course, in the links below, I will have the Facebook page, facebook.com slash find Tiffany. I've also seen references to a website, but the website is no longer there. So uh, if you see those references, uh, you won't need them. Uh, Tiffany's Facebook, I will also have in the description box below, as well as a link to a Reddit thread, um, which actually started a very interesting conversation. And that's something I always appreciate about reviewing these cases in this way is when it when other people are able to look at these cases and learn something from them. So pretty interesting Reddit thread. Of course, the web sleuth thread that I've mentioned several times in this video will be down below. And before I let you guys go, I just want to learn a little bit more about class kids. Uh, I've, I've heard about them here and there, but I didn't know a whole lot before today's case. If you want to learn more, you can go to class, that's K-L-A-A-S kids.org. The Class Kids Foundation was established in 1994 to give meaning to the death of my 12-year-old daughter, kidnap and murder victim, Polly Hannah Class, and to create a legacy in her name that would be protective of children for generations to come. This is obviously written by her father, Mark. Conceived with an inv initial investment of $2,000, the foundation's mission is to stop crimes against children. They've got a bunch of great programs here. Um, they are fingerprinting kids. They're getting pictures of kids. They're uh, keeping a database, but not of private information about these kids, which I think is a really cool thing to do. And uh, like I said earlier in this case, I was surprised that they actually had fingerprints. It's pretty rare that you actually have fingerprint information in these missing persons cases. So I'm glad that someone's trying to address that like they are here with what they call their print-a-thon program. Uh, I came here because in honor of Tiffany, I want to make a donation to this organization. And I have to say, it's not the easiest thing to find their donation page. So I will have a link to that down below as well. They have a fairly simple uh, PayPal donation. You can donate using PayPal funds or with a debit or a credit card. And once again, on behalf of myself and my wonderful supporters out there through Patreon and PayPal, uh, we're going to make a donation specifically to class kids so they can keep doing their fine work. Uh, and that donation will be made in honor of Tiffany Daniels. So once again, um, please share this video if you have friends in the Florida area. Um, tough case, uh, amazing family. Uh, I'm, I'm so impressed at the work that I've seen them do. I'm so impressed at how they keep uh, the media coming back year after year, and they keep re-raising exposure to this case. I wanted to do anything that I could to help them, uh, and that's why we are here talking today. If you happen to be the person, there is someone out there that has a piece to this puzzle, 
um, please, please, please do the right thing. Check out the description box below. Uh, I've got the information there where you can contact the authorities with the case number, which is super helpful. I've done it myself. And if you don't have the case number, it's not always the easiest thing. But even if you want to remain an anonymous, you can contact Crime Stoppers about this case as well. I've got a number down there for you. So please do the right thing. Please get that information in. Thank you so much for caring about these cases like I do, for watching this video, for sharing this video. I truly appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. And I hope to see you back here tomorrow on the Lord and Arts channel.